So when we talked about so-called initial interest, or preferably, I think, pre-sale confusion, we were talking about some ways in which trademarks could be used in generic ways, even though they were not themselves turning into generic marks not worthy of protection. So let's think about what Tylenol as a keyword could mean. It could mean that we are talking about a website that is sponsored by the company that makes Tylenol. It could be about a website that sells Tylenol. It could be a website that sells Tylenol but is actually being deceptive, does not really sell Tylenol. It could be about a website that sells acetaminophen. It could be about a website that sells pain reliever. It could be about a website that talks about Tylenol, acetaminophen, and or other pain relievers. It could be about a website that wants the attention of those interested in Tylenol. And we might have differing impressions about which kinds of uses as a keyword are acceptable or not. And what I was suggesting in the earlier lecture was that for somebody who is interested in generic acetaminophen, the use of Tylenol as the keyword does not necessarily mean that they are exclusively interested in Tylenol, but rather they may possibly be using the mark generically to signal a desire to have the active ingredient of Tylenol, which is acetaminophen and is also hard to spell. In thinking about what a consumer typing in Tylenol as a search term, what they possibly mean, maybe they mean, I am looking for Tylenol, but I am open to alternatives. I am looking for Tylenol and I am not open to alternatives. I am looking for a pain reliever like Tylenol. I am looking for information about Tylenol, acetaminophen, and or pain relievers in general. Or, you know, in my case, I'm a trademark professor curious about what po pops up for purposes of class prep. And so the point here is that we shouldn't be too casual about assuming what consumers necessarily want. And insofar as, as web searchers have a range of possible desires, trademark law should be open to the possibility that different searchers can have their interests satisfied or not, not necessarily to each other's detriment. That is, given the relative low search costs involved of a back click. The searcher who is interested in Tylenol and only Tylenol does not suffer great prejudice if they are diverted, to, you know, to use, the, to use the Brookfield language, to a website that is just simply providing information about pain relievers or perhaps generic acetaminophen. And so, as we talked about in the initial interest confusion lecture, the courts were, at an early stage, not so sympathetic to these alternative potential interests of, of, of searchers online, but there has been a decent amount of evolution in that direction, and I think that evolution is embodied quite well in the multi-time machine versus Amazon case. And so, in that case, Amazon does not have MTM watches on its website or as part of its ecosystem generally. However, when searchers would type in the trademark name of MTM or MTM Special Ops on the Amazon webpage, Amazon would not say, sorry, we don't have that here. What Amazon would do instead is serve up a list of search results that in Amazon's view were relevant to the search but did not, because again, MTM watches are not part of the Amazon ecosystem, MTM watches were not part of the list. However, the watches that were returned as part of the list were distinctly labeled with their own marks. There was no pretense made that the marks that were returned were in any way MTM watches. And so we can think a little bit about this practice. Are there benefits to consumers? And I would suggest that one potential set of benefits is that it exposes con consumers to a set of potential alternatives to MTM watches and thereby broadens the search universe for consumers and may alert them to watches that they may not otherwise have considered but are perhaps competitive with or comparable to MTM watches. Now, is there a potential harm here? Well, of course, MTM doesn't get the benefit of the search that the consumers were making, but query whether MTM has some kind of right 
to those searchers. After all, those searchers are on Amazon and they are not necessarily on and they are not on an MTM related site. Do consumers thereby experience a harm? Well, of course, if one wants MTM and only MTM, they are being served up with options that are the alternative, but the searchers are entirely free to go off Amazon, and there is no active deception going on about the relation between the watches that are served up on the page with MTM. Now, again, though, MTM, of course, is perhaps suffering, if not a legal wrong, a perhaps impediment to their ability to form a relationship with consumers. But of course, those consumers are not on an MTM affiliated website to begin with. And we get into this question of what is the proper analogy to make with regards to Amazon's practice. And of course, in the Brookfield case, we have this strained analogy to the highway billboard. Strained not because necessarily there isn't a potential effect on consumer search costs, but that the highway billboard was such a different effect in kind. And the likening of a misdirection on the highway and all the costs that go into finding one's true intended destination does not track in comparison to the kinds of costs that are expended online. And so here the court and the majority in the dissent have their own debate about what is the proper analogy. And so one way to look at it is somebody asking, do you have any Coke? And someone says in response, no Coke, Pepsi. And we can think of other ways to analogize what's going on, depending on one's views of this particular case. Do you have any Coke? Pepsi. Do you have any Coke? You get handed a clearly labeled Pepsi, um, displaying a Pepsi near a Coke display, or is this really like the billboard? And maybe for the dissent, there's more sympathy to the argument that this is akin to the billboard. Note, however, that the court has a very different approach to how the factors, the multi-factor test, applies to this case than in some of the situations we've seen before. So recall, we've seen a number of cases where the courts are willing to shoehorn non-source confusion cases into the multi-factor test and then adjusting the read of the factors in a somewhat pro-plaintiff manner, even though the harm at issue is not as clearly to the detriment of the consumer as we see in the kinds of cases for which the multi-factor test was developed. In MTM, the court has an entirely different attitude, saying in the present case, the eight-factor sleek craft test is not particularly apt. This is not surprising, as the sleek craft test was developed for a different problem, i.e. for analyzing whether two competing brands' marks are sufficiently similar to cause consumer confusion. And so the court just has a completely different attitude about the germaneness of the normal multi-factor test. And so the court says the issue we're dealing with here is somewhat different. This case will turn on the answers to the following two questions. Who is the relevant reasonable consumer and what would they reasonably believe based on what they saw on the screen. And when we get to the actual application of the factors, there's this focus on the type of goods, the degree of care, and the labeling and appearance of the products in context. So, so quite the opposite of what we saw the Sixth Circuit do in the context of the Maker's Mark case. And so here the court says, the labeling and appearance of the products for sale on Amazon's webpage is perhaps the most important factor in this case. This is because we have previously noted that clear labeling can eliminate the likelihood of initial interest confusion in cases involving internet search terms and all the other factors are comparatively downplayed. And so note, we just have a completely different attitude about the defendant conduct in this case. And there's sort of a baseline assumption on the part of the court that this kind of thing is okay, that it is all right to serve consumers up with alternatives to the particular brand for which they may be searching at a given moment, so long as there is no misrepresentation of there being a connection with the initial target of search. Intertwined with all this is an entirely different attitude about the sophistication of people conducting searches online. There's an entirely different calibration of who is the reasonably prudent consumer, and that is being used here to cabin the trademark cause of action. 
And so what does the court say? In light of the clear labeling Amazon uses on its search results page, no reasonable trier of fact could conclude that Amazon's search results page would likely confuse a reasonably prudent consumer accustomed to shopping online as to the source of the goods being offered. And so what kind of consumers do we have here? They're much more sophisticated than the ones we had in Brookfield. And of course, Brookfield is a case from relatively early in the, in, in the mask internet era. Here we have consumers who are sophisticated about product search, about online search, and sort of an understanding that you don't expect your web searches to automatically serve up the results that you're necessarily looking for at the outset. And here too, I think Thing, there is an appreciation that there may be competitive reasons to make uses of marks and that the trademarks can be information rich terms in the hands of third parties. And so a search for an MTM watch may be more useful to a consumer than a simple search for a watch. And so Amazon is not expected on the, by, by the court to disclose that they don't carry such watches. There's an, there's an expectation that consumers should be able to suss out that kind of thing for their own and not be sort of spoon fed the direct conclusion like, no, we don't have MTM watches, so long as the watches that are returned as part of those search results are, are clearly labeled correctly. And so we might ask some questions about this case. So the dissent says, look, this is all well and good. And maybe it's the case that consumers aren't necessarily going to be confused. But that sounds like a jury question. And the court is adjudicating these fact questions and sort of saying, you know, saying no one could possibly be confused, but we don't necessarily know that. But recall, of course, that a lot of the likelihood of confusion analysis is as much normative as it is descriptive. And what the majority is really doing here is making a very normative conclusion about what is the proper level of consumer sophistication, what kinds of consumers matter when we're evaluating this kind of search results. And now you can agree with this, you can disagree with this, you may think that is in some tension with the idea of trademark infringement litigation being a matter of empirical fact finding, the normative component of it aside. But note that if you take that point of view, you send a lot more to juries and you inject a lot more uncertainty into trademark law from the perspective of potential defendants, and therefore you increase significantly the interorum effect of cease and desist letters and plaintiff claims in general. So if one thinks that practices like Amazon's are in fact salutary, are in fact consumer welfare enhancing, then the way to get there is, I would argue, but you know, your mileage may vary, to resolve more or as much as possible of this dispute at a normative rather than at an empirical level. Now, we do have some interesting questions, though, that are left by MTM. And one of them concerns Amazon, because Amazon is not some, you know, plucky internet upstart trying to explore the boundaries of trademark law in the name of enhancing the consumer experience, right? Amazon is one of the online behemoths. And we may have a question about whether or not the market is going to adequately discipline Amazon insofar as its search practices are not salutary to consumers. And Amazon search practices have come under any number of criticisms from sellers using their sites who complain that if they don't pay for paid placement to Amazon, their results are not going to be you know, placed high enough so that consumers will be able to find them in the first place. And so we might ask the question whether or not Amazon is subject to sufficient market checks to this kind of behavior or to engaging activity in engaging in activities that maybe advantage Amazon and its preferred brands over consumers, that Amazon is not necessarily a good proxy for consumer interests, that the interest between consumers and Amazon may potentially diverge. We may also ask whether this ruling increases Amazon's power at the expense of independent sellers. And this is something that is, of course, one of the many reasons why Amazon is attracting a certain amount of antitrust scrutiny. The possibility that Amazon is favoring its own brands or its own interests at the expense of small sellers that may not be powerful enough to 
effectively bargain with Amazon and may feel like they have little choice but to be on Amazon. And if they don't want to be on Amazon, they, have, you know, they face certain struggles. And intertwined with all this is the idea that so many of us have tied so much of our consumer experience to the Amazon ecosystem that there is something potentially problematic about Amazon not doing more to signal to us that there are alternatives outside of the Amazon ecosystem. And even if we think that this is a true problem and that we may have concerns about the relationship between Amazon and its users, particularly Prime users, we might ask whether or not that is necessarily a trademark concern or necessarily a concern that is best addressed via trademark law versus some alternative legal regime. But there's an interesting you know, tension that arises from MTM because the court embraces a particular view of third party use of trademarks that to disclose my biases, I think is a good view and one that is resolves a tension between trademark holders and consumers in favor of the consumer but it hints at another concern of a potential issue for the consuming public, not between consumers and trademark holders, but rather consumers and Amazon and really large, powerful online internet entities. And the question of how best to address that problem to the extent that we think it is a problem, and then now to the point I made before, even if we think arguendo that it is an issue, whether trademark law is an appropriate means for going after it.